Hey guys. I made a video about shifting gender norms recently that I've linked below. In that video, I talk about the different reasons that we've seen this shift, particularly in the millennial generation. Being raised by single mothers, classroom environments, unnecessary ADD diagnoses, and I briefly touched on some chemical variables that I suspect play a part in this phenomenon. But what I didn't discuss, and I think one so ubiquitous that it warrants its own video, is the unforeseen effects of hormonal birth control use on women and on society. At my high school, many girls, whether or not they were sexually active, were advised by their mothers and their doctors to go on birth control at around the age of 16. The common excuse here was to regulate their periods, even though menstrual irregularity in teenage years is completely normal. I surmise that the real reason this was being pushed on teenage girls was that their parents did not want to know if they were sexually active or really have a discussion about sex at all. So they were just doing this as a preventive measure under the guise that they were being good parents by solving this invented health issue. Since everyone was always told that birth control was safe and had no long-term side effects, no one seemed that concerned about it. But a few years ago, which was around the time that these girls would have been on the pill for about a decade, I began to hear some stories from friends and friends of friends that really alarmed me and led me to believe that there were going to be some serious and unforeseen consequences to widespread birth control use. I heard that this girl who had been on birth control since she was about 15 or 16 and was now around 30 had gone off birth control after she got married in her late 20s and suddenly out of nowhere could not stomach the smell of her husband who she had been with for many years. I've actually heard some variation of this story a few times. It turns out there is some serious science behind women choosing and eliminating mates using their sense of smell. This is from the New York Times in 2002 and as always is linked below. Evidence that women prefer the odor of men who are genetically similar to themselves, though not too similar, has emerged from a study at the University of Chicago. A further twist in the study, which was based on having women sniff t-shirts that a man had worn for two days, is that their preferences were based on the man's genetic match to each woman's paternal genes, not genes from her mother. The two senior authors of the study believe the gene matching system may be favored by evolution because it helps avert the risks of both inbreeding and outbreeding. The genes at issue produce proteins that identify the body's cells as self, not foreign to the immune system. They are known to biologists as MHC genes for major histocompatibility complex. Women are able to smell when someone will produce a suitable genetic match with them, when it is just different enough to avoid inbreeding, but not so different that you're choosing from an outgroup. The science behind this suggests that this evolutionary response serves to limit issues with offspring, such as failure to thrive or even just general physical unattractiveness. And birth control messes with this age-old evolutionary response that is tried and true for mate selection. A 2008 study suggests that women on the pill undergo a shift in preference towards men who share similar MHC genes. The female subjects were more likely to rate genetically similar men's scents as pleasant and desirable after they went on the pill as compared with before. Although no one knows why the pill affects attraction, some scientists believe that pregnancy, or in this case, the hormonal changes that mimic pregnancy, draws women toward nurturing relatives. You may be on the pill and it has hindered your ability to appropriately mate select, so you've chosen someone too genetically similar or dissimilar to you. When you go off the pill, you're disgusted by their smell and are no longer sexually attracted to them. But smell is only one factor here. This is from The Atlantic. Women on birth control pills prefer less masculine men. Women who use computers to design their ideal man saw a change in their preferred facial features after going on the pill. Researchers in Scotland designed several experiments that delve further into the hormonal quirks wrought by birth control. In the first, they gave young straight women the ability to digitally alter images of male faces. The participants tinkered with features like cheekbone prominence, jaw height, and face width, attempting to find the perfect ratio of attractiveness for either a short or long-term relationship. None of the women were taking birth control at the outset. After the experiment, they were given the option to start, which about a third took. Three months later, the experiment was repeated. In the second study, volunteers were asked to rate the manliness of men in relationships based on their mugshots. Half, 85 of these men, were dating women who had been on the pill when they first met. After beginning a regimen of hormonal birth control, the women's ideal of attractiveness in a potential romantic partner skewed significantly less masculine. They were more likely, for example, to prefer narrower jawbones and rounder faces. These preferences appear to translate to real-life decisions. The men whose partners had been on the pill when they first started dating were found, as a whole, to be less masculine-looking. This makes sense. It's like choosing a lifelong mate while drunk. When you sober up, you realize this person is not what they appeared to be after a few drinks, and your perception of them changes. 
Birth control causes you to seek less masculine and more nurturing partners. It also reduces your libido. So when these women go off the pill, their sexual urges return, and they're more attracted to high T masculine men and often view the partners that they chose while on birth control as feminine and unattractive. I would imagine that the high prevalence of birth control use, 16% at present in women ages 15 to 44, although 98% of sexually active women have reported using birth control at some point, has a big impact on marital success. Of course, I can't prove this, but I would imagine that if you suddenly become disgusted with your husband, your marriage is going to take a hit. I would also imagine that birth control, outside of outright preventing pregnancy, is also contributing to our demographic issues. If women cannot properly mate select and have a reduction in libido, they're less likely to have more and thriving offspring. And there are more acute risks with birth control as well. Messing with your hormones, especially long-term, is no joke. Your hormones control so much about you, and I've heard plenty of stories of women stopping the pill because it changed their personalities or their ability to control emotion. How's that for irony? That this was supposed to make women feel more in control of their lives, yet some have to quit because they lose control of their personalities. There's a strong association between birth control use and mood swings, and most troubling between hormonal birth control and depression. I've linked the study based on over 1 million Danish women below for your review. The researchers concluded that the use of hormonal contraceptives was associated with subsequent antidepressant use and first diagnosis of depression at a psychiatric hospital among women living in Denmark. Adolescents seem more vulnerable to this risk than women 20 to 34 years old. There are physical risks as well. The commonly known ones are acne, weight gain, low libido, headaches. But what is less commonly known and certainly isn't being discussed by groups like Planned Parenthood is that birth control use seems to have a correlation with an increased risk of breast cancer. In 2017, a large prospective Danish study reported breast cancer risks associated with more recent formulations of oral contraceptives. Overall, women who were using or had recently stopped using oral combined hormone contraceptives had a modest about 20% increase in the relative risk of breast cancer compared with women who had never used oral contraceptives. The risk increase varied from 0% to 60% depending on the specific type of oral combined hormone contraceptive. The risk of breast cancer also increased the longer oral contraceptives were used. Of course, proving this direct link is nearly impossible, and this may be a flawed conclusion because women with children have a much lower rate of breast cancer than childless women, and women on birth control are actively preventing pregnancy. So draw your own conclusions about this specific correlation. I didn't mention all of the physical and emotional side effects of birth control in the interest of time, but I will say that just intuitively, it seems like a bad idea to me. I wouldn't even take a Tylenol every single day. Yet we're supposed to believe that altering our hormones and preventing ovulation, sometimes consistently over the course of two decades, is not going to have some sort of grave consequence individually or for society. I don't buy it. As far as larger societal issues are concerned, birth control has allowed for a culture of casual sex to develop, which we all know is detrimental to gender relations and has real emotional ramifications. It has eliminated the biggest consequence of sex, but the fear of the social backlash for having a baby out of wedlock did add a weight of responsibility to relationships. All of the other risks, emotional and physical, remain. In terms of STDs, their prevalence has increased for obvious reasons, and new issues developed as society responded to an era of unrestricted promiscuity. Gender relations have never been worse, marriage rates are down, and we are in a demographic spiral. The real question is, has birth control made society better? Has it helped women? Are women now better off than their grandmothers? I would have to say no. This is from a paper called The Paradox of Declining Female Happiness. By most objective measures, the lives of women in the U.S. have improved dramatically over the past 35 years. Moreover, women believe that their lives are better. In recent polls asking about changes in the status of women over the past 25 or 50 years, around four in five adults state that the overall status of women in the U.S. has gotten better, and the remaining respondents break two for one towards stayed the same over worse. Additionally, the 1999 Virginia Slims poll found that 72% of women believe that women having more choices in society today gives women more opportunities to be happy, while only 39% thought that having more choices makes life more complicated for women. Finally, women today are more likely than men to believe that their opportunities to succeed exceed those of their parents. Yet trends in self-reported subjective well-being indicate that happiness has shifted toward men and away from women. First, there may be other important socioeconomic forces that have made women worse off. A number of important macro trends have been documented. Decreased social cohesion, increased anxiety and neuroticism, and increased household risk. 
While each of these trends have impacted both men and women, it is possible for even apparently gender neutral trends to have gender biased impacts if men and women respond differently to these forces. So women are more sensitive to social destabilization and a lack of social cohesion than men. The second possibility is that broad social shifts such as those brought on by the changing role of women in society fundamentally alter what measures of subjective well-being are capturing. Over time, it is likely that women are aggregating satisfaction over an increasingly larger domain set. For example, life satisfaction may have previously meant satisfaction at home and has increasingly come to mean some combination of satisfaction at home and satisfaction at work. This averaging over many domains may lead to falling average satisfaction if it is difficult to achieve the same degree of satisfaction in multiple domains. One piece of evidence along these lines is that the correlation between happiness and marital happiness is lower for women who work compared with those who are stay-at-home wives. And the correlation has fallen over time for all women in our sample. This basically just means that today's woman has the expectation of succeeding at home and at work, which is just this idiotic concept of having it all. So few people can actually do that. Phyllis Schlafly, end of list. Finally, the changes brought about through the women's movement may have decreased women's happiness. The increased opportunity to succeed in many dimensions may have led to an increased likelihood of believing that one's life is not measuring up. Similarly, women may now compare their lives to a broader group, including men, and find their lives more likely to come up short in this assessment. Or women may simply find the complexity and increased pressure in their modern lives to have come at the cost of happiness. I'm not saying that birth control alone is responsible for the decline in women's happiness, but it contributed massively to this philosophy that women should behave just like men. This sense of independence it is supposedly given women really just seems to have created unrealistic expectations for success and driven down our levels of happiness. Further, it shifted women's roles from a smaller, more manageable domain, that of keeping up a home and a family, to a much larger domain, being successful at home and at work. Today, if a woman is a homemaker alone, she is largely viewed as a failure. And if she is a childless career woman, irrespective of success, she will also be viewed as a failure. So the million dollar question, how do we remedy this? Well, the first thing would be to readjust expectations. We need to recalibrate the measure of female success. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard career women dog on stay-at-home moms for being lazy. That perception needs to change. In terms of the pill, I am conflicted about it. I don't want to discount it entirely because I am pro-life and I want to reduce the prevalence of abortion. But it has obviously severely damaged society and I would argue has done much more harm than good. I don't think it should be treated as this gateway to female independence or as a rite of passage for teenagers especially. It needs to be used as sparingly as possible and doctors should discourage its use. Let me know what you think in the comment section. Is the potential reduction in unwanted pregnancy and abortion reason enough to continue unfettered birth control prescription to women? Are there any other pros and cons that I've missed? I'd love to know what you think. Thanks folks and I'll see you soon. Bye.